Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, David, the organizer. It's a wonderful air show, it's awesome. Anyway, uh, let's look at some of the key things. I'd like to begin with the market background. Uh, this is basically what has happened in, in Asia Pacific. You look at the numbers right now, it's, it's just phenomenal. You see the signing of aircraft today, uh, the Airbus signs nearly 100 aircraft just with VietJet alone. Uh, look at uh, with the passenger traffic growth in the last 10 years in Asia Pacific. Malaysia had 28.5 million in 2002 and today it's, I mean in 2012 it's 67 million passenger growth. That's a cake of 9% higher than that of GDP and even the projections that you see. Indonesia alone, uh, coming in 2002 at 29.1 million, today is already at 77.4 million. That's a cake of 10.3%. These numbers are just phenomenal. Uh, again, the last two, uh, interesting. Vietnam, uh, in 2002 at 8.8 .8 million passengers, today is already at 25.4, which is 11.2% CAGR per annum. Myanmar uh, just opened its doors, but now from 1.2 is surging ahead to 5.6, a CAGR of 16.7%. You look at these numbers, it's just awesome. And today when you talk about MRO, uh, this aircraft is now due and, and that's where we are today. So can you imagine uh, what it requires, uh, the amount of from everything from reg regulatory works that needs to support the passenger, uh, the aircraft manufacturers that pumps the aircraft into it, and again you're fighting over the same labour and talent pool that needs to support this. The numbers is awesome, uh, it's all about now how do we align and what does these changes and dynamics affect us. So again as I said, with this as a background, I mean it's, it's, it's awesome. <coughs> Zooming a little bit in terms of nation uh, uh, aerospace industry, today uh, the nation MRO industry is valued at 1.8 billion. Uh, the total is a contribution of nation of 70% of the total aerospace industry. Uh, if you look at the pie chart, we have the commercial aviation, that's the airline and the operations of it. MRO accounts for 17% of it. And we also got manufacturing uh, that goes in terms of 8%. So that's basically the aerospace industry in, in Malaysia. And it's growing. Uh, it goes back to the blueprint that we started uh, 20 years ago, in 1995. Uh, at that point in time, the Malaysian government, uh, the Tun Mahathir, we wanted to have a blueprint where we want to take the aerospace industry. This was the four key areas, the four trusts that we wanted. One was actually in terms of the MRO itself. Two was basically aerospace manufacturing and the engineers uh, side that, that we we're going on. Third is in terms of avionic and system integration. And last uh, is all about the talent pool. We, we failed to see the number we went in and, and the importance right now is in terms of aerospace training and education. So we need to have the, the manpower that supports that. So this was the four quadrant that was uh, earmarked in uh, what you call the National Aerospace Blueprint. By that point in time, um, the concept was very much we had a blueprint, so let's get everybody going along with this idea. Okay, but there was not really a, what you call an active role and how do we get point A to point B. This is where we like to be, but there was no real uh, plan in detail that goes up. So there, there are successes and things that we could have done better. Okay, in the ecosystem today, uh, we're changing uh, where the GNI is expected to be 4.2 billion US for the entire uh, aerospace industry, generating 21,000 jobs in Malaysia. These are the current MRO hubs today. Uh, we have in, in uh, what you call, the primary hub is in, in uh, Subang. Uh, that's through MIAC, Malaysian International Aeros Aerospace Center, with Aero uh, AE, which is, which is there, and we have also MS Engineering, and, and those are the companies operating in the, in the Subang Valley. Uh, besides that, we have KLIA, uh, which is now moving on more of uh, MS Engineering and with EBA setting up in, uh, with a joint venture in Sepang Aircraft Engineering in, in KLIA. And we have another hub, which is uh, Senai, which is under the Senai Airport. Aerospace Park is also part of the development in, in that airport. So these are largely the, the parks that, that will contribute as a cluster road. But again, as I said just now, the difference was phase one was a roadmap. It was just a paint of picture of where we are today and where we'd like to be. But then the government realised that we didn't get the traction. Uh, then Idris Yala 
uh, and his team for Commando. When in and identified what the constraints really, uh, what we did good and what we didn't. And right now, let's accelerate the program uh, of transformation in the industry. So basically, they called industries, and then we had a series of labs. What you see here is, is basically what are the things that we need to unleash it. I mean, similar to what India is doing, but now it's, it's focused. Where the government's role is more facilitating it, identifying what are the constraints and how do we facilitate that growth. And with the ETP, Economic Transformation Plan, uh, that focuses primarily in terms of grow MRO. One, I mean, there's a three step approach or three, uh, three trust now. One is to improve the industry structure which is to establish a strong Malaysian MRO service provider that can develop the supply chain and drive that. Uh, second right now is to completize DCA or to facilitate the Civil Aviation Authority and how it works with industry to develop uh, far more competent in MRO support services. Expanding to high, higher and value added services. So besides MRO, now you see as well as airline seats are becoming commodity and so will the impact of MRO becoming a commodity and we'll discuss that in terms of how the dynamics change. Uh, having said that now, I mean, how do we extract greater value in, in MRO services and as well as value-added engineering? Okay? <coughs> and there's a need uh, to have a greater component support and, and I'll, I'll get back to that later. And uh, to, I mean, again, expanding the higher value-added is enlarging MRO services to include rotable spares. Uh, because as, as a chart, I think David pointed to the chart, I mean, it's quite simple. The airframe MRO is very much labor intensive with 70% and 30% sorry, 30 on, on, on material and components. Uh, the engine on the far end, which is all OEM dominated, because it is 70% uh, uh, accountable for material portion and 30% labor. So that's why it's far more leveraged by OEM. But the center ground actually is component. Component today is almost 50 50 between labor as well as component. The dynamics in, 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 uh, in this region. Uh, as well as we have engine that's set up here, but mostly of the components are very limited as done here, but basically is outsourced back again to Europe or the US. This, uh, this is an opportunity because most of it will have power by the component at the front end, but at the back end, the main side is done, uh, is by sending back. So there's a post type opportunity really in the component side to expand, uh, because that's not so much in terms of there's, there's growth, but also the transition in terms of how we change the, the value add in, in the supply chain. Okay, So again, uh, having said that right now, the development of human capital is essential. It is not so much in terms of the competency to do work. It is also about uh, the quality, culture and, and, and the passion in innovation. So that is something that, that we really need to underline in terms of the development trust to get to where we want. Okay. So we have Commando now facilitate, we have the industry that now is actually unleashing the potential to facilitate greater investment and greater growth. Uh, we have MIDA, uh, the Malaysian One Stop Centre, uh, that will facilitate this. I mean, there's so many incentives that they have in terms of various part. Uh, now I'd like to share a little bit in terms of what we see on the ground. Uh, as I said right now, the past was the trend in terms of uh, what has happened, and I said the numbers is just phenomenal. The question we have, uh, without painting the pictures, right now from getting point A to point B, how best do we strategize and align ourselves? Taking this a little bit, uh, we see in terms of the airline spread, as well as the technology begins to change, uh, new aircraft, the next generation aircraft comes in, there will be a wall by the time you see uh, the change between uh, NGs and uh, seven, I mean the A320 Classics and the next generation. So you will see that, that transition in terms of new technologies and engines, which means uh, there will be a line that's drawn in terms of what the MRO spends and, and when the engines, uh, I mean, changes will, will take place. Having said right now, uh, what powers the growth now you see is far more in terms of the A320s that comes in. Uh, but what, basically what customers are looking for, as I said, not, MRO is becoming a far more com commodity. But what are the key things, constraints that the airline is looking for? Far more before cost actually is the liability in terms of uh, time. Uh, then only in terms of competitive pricing. So these are the value that the customer really looks for. Uh, flexibility in terms of payment terms, uh, as well as new airlines that start up. You see what powers up in the region is a new airline that starts up. So flexible payment terms, how can they help the cash flow as they grow up? And uh, the thing right now is a very flight incentive. Uh, people are looking right now, uh, how do you do that to, to mitigate the distance? Okay, and past performance. These, these are basically what are the key drivers or demands by the customer in by the airline in the region. <coughs> okay. 
And I think the discussion just now into what will happen in the near future, the dynamics of the chart that David presented in terms of between uh, the OEM and, and the independent. Um, so, as I said right now, I mean, the airline also will, on this side, is also looking at the, the, the what you call, the dynamics or the different portfolio of the airlines. They are government back and, and the way they look in terms of different national aspiration to have a one stop, to have a independent, I mean, to have a KBT that's, that's indigenous. But there's a legacy career right now. Uh, the legacy career now has got to see this as a uh, aviation business. So basically an airline business is one, there is an MRO business is one. So that, that's what I see a transformation of the airline itself. The demand MRO comes in up front in terms of what are the airlines that fits into the system. Uh, legacy carriers has, is now going under transformation themselves that will focus on, on the aviation business, not just on the airline itself. Okay, well else uh, you have the government back airline that wanted to have a whole entire smorgasbord of capability. But low cost carrier, there's, 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 there's uh, basically with the core business, focus on airline and outsource because it's all about controlling costs. Now having said that, uh, people will look in terms of the value. Uh, if I can control costs better, it's better for me to do in-house. If I do not, I don't have the capability to control costs, I will surely outsource it and go in competitive right now. So having said right now, what are the chances in terms of this? I mean, on the ground right now, uh, Boeing and Airbus is packaging a total value package and, and even airline affiliates are doing that packaging concern. But when you go back to the airline, is that really what the airline wants? Airline wants to have the ability to control their costs. Okay, and that's basically the better. As well, you're trying to split it up and because you're trying to deal with it. Uh, but really, uh, what the airline wants is the ability for them to control their costs. Okay? And what value do you get out of that? So, so I said right now, there will be that dynamics. And having said right now, MROIC will be a commodity. Uh, low cost carrier, which basically if you look at most of the airlines that's growing in this region in, in Asia Pacific, far more low cost carrier with that business model, their decision or MRO spend will mean right now I will go up to, I will control it in terms of portion by portion. It's no longer, I mean, for engines, I understand because you can't change much in terms of the variable control. I'll outsource that and have a longer term contract. But for airframe, uh, it's more in terms of looking in terms of the commodity market and what's available out there. And, and they will go in and shop and spend to whatever they can control and have that benefit for their, for their organization, okay? Uh, that's, that's basically what I see. Okay, uh, we're coming to the tail end, but if, before I end, I just need to have a, a sales pitch on, on the people who sponsored me here. Okay, a uh, little bit of, uh, of Aero Aerospace. Aero Aerospace actually is it's within the group of Nandi that handles both uh, the defense side, the aerospace manufacturing, as well as the MRO, and we have an affiliate uh, airline which is with uh, Line Air called Malindo. Okay, uh, AE now uh, is, is a focus, is a rebrand or refocus from Aerot. Aerot primarily was military with a small business unit on commercial. In 2012, we decided to spin, spin off that completely as commercial MRO, and uh, basically, in a short period of time, we've got uh, 11 Airwonders uh, certificates and accolades and manpower strength of 2060 and growing. Uh, hopefully, uh, as fast as the region. Okay, that's all our approval from FAA EASA in a uh, short period of one year's time. And that's our facility. We have uh, 12 ways of unleashing capacity and capability to the region. With that, I'd like to thank you.